But we are excited here this morning at the Layton campus because we have the FCA director that is going to share uh, week three in the Habit series. Um, Pastor Brian's been meeting with him um, since January. Uh, we're building a great relationship. I love this guy. Um, so have a warm welcome for Eddie Williams here with us this morning. Thank you. Thanks. How's everybody doing this morning? We good? Cool. So I... I, I'm part of the FCA. I played a few sports. I played badminton. I mean, it was an equestrian, rode horses, um, gymnastics. Yeah, I competed nationally. Gym, I'm just kidding. Obviously, I, I probably could tell I played football or I'm some sort of UFC fighter or something like that. But no, I played football. I uh, played five seasons in the National Football League. I uh, moved to Utah a few years ago with my family uh, here for uh, the Fellowship of Christian Athletes. Super excited to be a part of it. I've uh, been walking with uh, your pastor, Brian, for a long time, um, working through some of the mentoring and what does FCA look like uh, in Utah. So uh, glad to be with you guys. It's very exciting. Let me pray. Oh, that's awesome. Wow, gosh. You know, you know the morning service, they're on, they're on time. Like, they're on time, but man, they're not, they're not awake yet. You know, I think they should bump back to the 10, 30, 12 o'clock or something like that or come to the Saturday night. So let me pray for us, and then we'll get started. Lord Jesus, uh, I'm praying for your blessing here, Lord. I'm praying for your spirit to move here today, Lord God, as we, as we tackle an awesome topic about walking by the spirit, Lord. I pray that you model that for us, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit here. Um, I pray for the, everyone that's here, their, their hearts and their minds, that they're prepared, um, that they're, they've been ready, that they've been prepared, been prepared for beforehand, Lord God. And, and I pray for the kids in our kids' ministry, Lord. May you do work here today. Uh, may, we sit, may this be profitable for all of us, Lord, but also, and more importantly, pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So, uh, Alpine Church has been walking for the last few weeks uh, in our habit series, and this has been uh, a, a journey through, partially through the book of Galatians. And so we're going to be camped in Galatians 5. So if you're here in Galatians 5 and you've got a Bible or an app, that would be a great place to open up. But we've been following this guy, Paul, right? And this guy, Paul, has been um, teaching this church in Galatians some, some very, very important details about the facts of the gospel, mainly that we are all broken and need a savior. Raise your hand here if you feel like when you hear that statement that kind of doesn't fit you, you're not broken, you, you've got it all together. Okay, so I'm spot on with that. No one's got it perfect. Um, so if, you're, if you play sports at all and um, you have ever watched film on yourself, you'll know right away that you're not perfect. Right, so I, I, my job was to, people think, what do play, football players do on, on during the week? You know, what do they, they just show up and play sports and that's it? Take pictures? Well, we watch a lot, we've watched a lot of film on ourselves and it's really actually pretty sad to know that you actually fail a lot more than you succeed. But if you want to find out how imperfect you are, let's just watch film on yourself. So if you're at a job, why don't you set your iPhone up? And maybe you're in your cubicle. And you're going there, boom, boom, oh, mistyped. Oh, you've got a delete button, so it makes it feel like, you know, you're not really making mistakes. But you are. You're not perfect. But Paul's saying that we're not perfect. We're, we have failed in some capacity, right? That's what he's telling uh, the, the church of Galatians. He's also saying that Jesus went to the cross and has made a way for us to be right with God. That our, our sin has separated us from God, but Jesus has made it possible. He's telling uh, the church of Galatians that. Well, in Galatians 5, it gets a little, a little bit more practical. Just a little bit more practical. He says this, that when we start a relationship with Jesus, it has to affect our habits. Go figure. You've ever heard the phrase that you are the, the average of the five people you hang out with most? Has anybody heard that? Well, that's why we tell our kids to not hang out with the rough crowd because they begin to act and look like those people. Um, so I'll just be candid here for a second. I didn't say this in the last service because they're tired. Um, uh, I'm a mixed race individual, okay? So I'm, my, my, my dad, my father's African American, my mother is Portuguese and, and English and French, so I'm just this like mutt of stuff. So anywhere I go, it's an interracial dialogue because no one has my genetic makeup other than my, my, my sister, and so it's very tough to find somebody. But I'll find myself, especially in a place like Utah, I get around friends and let's, can I just be honest, you're mostly white, okay? You're mostly white. <laughs> Just throw that out there, okay? You, I don't think that's, like, I'm white? No, you're white, most of you. And you get around those people and you just act different. 
Okay? Then when I go, with, when I go home and I, and I hang out with uh, my, foot, my teammates, the majority of them are African American or Hispanic or something, I act different. So I'm like, what's up, man? What's going on? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I go over here. I'm like, how you doing, sir? Not, not very nice to meet you. And <laughs> you just, you just the average of the five people. My wife's laughing. She knows what it's like. But it's, it's interesting. You become the average of the people you're around. And so if you're in a relationship with Jesus, you begin to act, think, change, look different. You have to be. You have to look different. So that's what Paul is getting at. And the way we, we kind of describe that in Christianity is we call it walking by the Spirit. We're, we're walking in God's guidance by the power of the Holy Spirit. And now, I became a Christian at age 18. And so, you know, I, I wasn't always familiar with this language, this lingo. There was the Spirit, the worship, and there's these words. And my only experience with the, this language prior were, was horror movies. Let's be honest with you. I watched a really inappropriate amount of horror movies as a 16-year-old. And... I won't get into that, but when I heard walking by the Spirit, I'm thinking, that sounds creepy. Like, I'm walking by the Spirit. The Spirits are within me. So, <laughs> like, I'm like, what is going So when I heard this in church, I'm like, what? I don't want anything to do with walking by the Spirit. That sounds like walking dead, you know? Um, and then, you know, there was the language of worship, and I thought that was, you know, you're bowing down, but we all worship, and it just, it creeped me out. It did. So if, if you're here and you're, you're not a Christian, you're not familiar with this language, you're not, you're not alone. I think a lot of people don't, you know, don't really resonate with that right off the bat. It's not language we typically use. And so let me break that down for you guys. Let me explore it a little bit. Our first, our first point here, that walking by the Spirit is relationship-based. Now, I don't know if you're expecting me to say that or not, but I think the Christian's life is the natural overflow of a relationship with Jesus. It's the natural overflow. It's going to happen. If you're in relationship with someone, you're going to begin to act, think, and be shaped by that person, okay? Paul actually talks about this in Galatians uh, 4. He says this, Formerly, when you did not know God, you were enslaved to those by, that by nature are not God's. But now that you have come to know God, or rather, to be known by God, how can you turn back to the weak and worthless elementary principles of the world whose slaves you want to be once more. So think about this. Think about, focus it on that little phrase there. But now that you have come to know God, or rather be known by God, how can you go back to acting silly? Think about this. Think about if your top five friends were Rick Warren, Billy Graham, um, uh, let's say uh, uh, Martin Luther, two other Christian guys, right? Really Christian people, okay? You're like, oh, this guy doesn't know his sister. Okay, John Calvin, I don't know. Okay, five really, really impactful people. Paul is saying, how can you then begin to act crazy? Why are you all of a sudden not modeling at all the relationships that you hold? It doesn't make sense. That's exactly what he's saying here. So it's a relationship based for us. And I know that the propensity for most believers is to say that Christianity isn't necessarily a relationship based. I've heard that, but more importantly, it's a set of rules, it's a laws, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, my guiding light that if I live, it's rules that if I live this way by Jesus' example, then I will have a better life. But that's not what walking by the Spirit is. No, it's not at all. Walking by the Spirit is a result of an encounter with a living God. It's the result of an encounter over and over again with a living God. Not an encounter with a, a, a book. Not an encounter with a book. Now, we believe this book is infallible, that it's the most important book there is, that it's absolutely perfect, that it speaks truth. But as we read, you've got to be known by God. You absolutely have to be known by God relationally. This also bleeds into relationships with others, doesn't it? Think about that. So, I think in America now, especially in the Western world and the state of religion, the way, the way it's been perceived is that you have to have a private prayer life. You have to have a private Bible reading life. And then everything that you um, are doing with your faith has to be kind of behind closed doors. Oh, this is my private prayer life. I, you know, it, it doesn't bleed into anything else. You don't talk about it at work. You don't talk about it uh, anywhere else. You, you come to church. This is the place you talk about it. And then when you leave, it doesn't come up anymore. And I think that's what's being told of us, but that's absolutely not true. We can't, we cannot grow, we cannot walk by the Spirit alone. We can't do it. In fact, the Bible models it in the book of Acts. You see the ways we come together as people. 
So one of the ways we come together is we gather in the temple courts. That's what they used to do. They would gather in big groups like this. Great way to, to engage Jesus. Another way is in small groups. Some of you guys have community groups or small groups. You, you gather in your homes over, over meals, and you, you gather in that way. Another way is with your mentor. You may have a mentor here at Alpine. You meet with this person one-on-one. The Bible says, where two or more are gathered, there I am with you. So Jesus' spirit is always there together. And so you cannot just have a private life. You cannot just have a private Jesus life and, and, and then uh, bifurcate it from the whole rest of your life. It doesn't exist that way. If you have a relationship with somebody truly, it will bleed into every facet of your life. It's impossible. It's absolutely impossible. Okay. So it's relationship-based. What else? Walking by the Spirit is Spirit-empowered. It's Spirit-empowered. Now, I think the, another propensity for us as, as Christians, as non-Christians, as just people, is our default mode to retreat back into is this kind of self fulfillment, self-empowerment, um, self-actualization, where we kind of hold the keys to the kingdom in our lives, and that you can do it if you put your mind to it, and you're unique, and you just go tackle whatever you want to do in your life. But Jesus is not saying that, okay? We're, the, the Bible is not saying that. We're actually saying that the Spirit empowers our lives, not the self. Here's what Paul says in, in uh, Galatians 5. So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And then the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of the sinful nature's desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other, so you are not free to carry out your good intentions. Wow, so we're not free to carry out our good intentions. So if you are self-actualizing, if you are self um, you are, you're pursuing the self, you're trying to grow with yourself, Paul is saying, no, 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 don't do that. Your, your good intentions, as, as nice as they are, they're actually the opposite of what the Spirit wants you to do. Why is that, you ask? Well, hear, this, hear me out. Anything done outside of a relational, covenantal relationship with Jesus is typically not what God wants you to do. God wants you to do what they, they always say there's this phrase, there's no better place to be than in the will of God. There's no better place to be in the will of God. We want to be connected to the power source at all times. I've come up with a, a very modern um, analogy for you, okay? So here's this iPhone, okay? This iPhone is on, okay? It's locked, but it's on. And this iPhone has got, you know, 70% battery. And it's empowered to do what it needs to be done. But why is it on? Why is it on? It's on because it was at once connected to a power source. For you teenagers out there, you understand that your phone dies every, you know, two hours because you're playing Pokemon Go and you're bumping into stuff and you, you can't, right? Your phone dies, okay? What the phone cannot do is it cannot say, you know what? I got really charged that one time by that power source. I think I'm going to live my life without it. I think I feel good enough to, to, to do the work. I can tweet. I can text. I can find Pikachu right here. I can, I can just go on my Gmail account. I can do the things I want to do. I can Google Maps, everything. But eventually what happens? This phone will die. It cannot say from within itself, oh, I'm going to stay on. Here we go. Ah, I'm going to the safari. Here we go. It doesn't work like that, does it? It's the same with you and your faith. Some of us think that we essentially meet Jesus at one time event, maybe a camp or some sort of Billy Graham crusade, and we meet Jesus, and boom, I'm on, and I'm off to live my life without him. No, it doesn't work like that. We are called to be in a relational, relational, covenantal relationship with him throughout our entire lives. You can't live apart from him. You cannot do it. You can't do it. Because then you begin to run on your own power, your good intentions. Mm. Okay. What else? Walking by the Spirit also looks a certain way. It also looks a certain way. Now, there's these things called the fruits of the Spirit, right, in our lives. You guys have heard of those, right? They do not just grow. Osmosis, right? You are not like a fine wine when placed in a cellar. You develop and nurture and change. and It just doesn't happen. There, there is something that has to happen to you. Things begin to change in you, okay? And it's going to look differently. The Bible talks about our aromas being different. 
there's something about somebody else that goes, man, something's different about him. And people know it, and we can't really quite put our finger on it. You know what I'm talking about? Some of you, some of you guys have that person at, at work or in school where they're just different. Let's see what Paul says about this. Um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23, he says this, the Holy Spirit produces the kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Now, some of you have that memorized. Some of you were mouthing that, and thank you for that. I actually took a test just a few weeks ago um, for some church stuff, and uh, by happenstance, this question was on there, and it said, what are the fruits of the Spirit? And I'm like, oh yeah, bang, 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 and I forgot one. And you know which one it was? It was patience. And I'm like, oh man. Clearly, in my life, that's modeled out that I can't seem to remember patience. It's ridiculous, but I tend to be impatient. You know, just ask my wife if you want to know the backstory on that. But what's interesting about the fruits of the Spirit is that they tend to grow symmetrically. If, if you're truly connected to your power source, you cannot grow in self-control. Like, man, I feel like my self-control is just through the roof right now. And just be completely and utterly impatient. It doesn't work like that. It absolutely doesn't work like that. You become an apple on a branch disconnected from the tree and the root, and you've bared some fruit, but that fruit won't last long. It will eventually die because it's not connected to the power source. It can no longer produce life. And so if you're growing in one of these areas, I'm really kind right now. But you just feel like, man, I just don't have joy in my life. I don't have peace in my life. Friends, you aren't connected to the power source of Jesus. You're not connected to him. You may be trying to grow. You may be working on some of these things. Some of us may be genetically predisposed to gentleness and kindness and goodness or self-control. You may be predisposed to that. But how can you grow in your self-control and not grow in your love? How can you do that? Some of you are married. You say, I'm, I've got lots of self-control. But if you don't love, if you don't love, how can you truly be, have self-control? How can you truly do that? When another woman walks by, when another man walks by, when, when, when faithfulness is tempted and you're not loving, how is that going to work? How is that going to play out? If, if you feel like you're incredibly gentle, but you don't have peace in your heart, you're anxious all of the time, if you feel like you're, you're really faithful, but you don't have any peace, but you're riddled with anxiety, you know that peace is the antidote to anxiety, right? All of these things will grow in proportion to one another. Does that make sense? They will all grow in proportion to one another. And people are going to notice. People are going to say, man, something's different about him. I, I, there's a, I'm going to tell you a quick story. So when I was in the locker room, one of my first years playing football, I came in and I heard a really interesting conversation going on between five or six guys that I thought was just, just kind of the total depravity at its finest, to be honest with you. They were mostly married men, and they were all in a circle. And they were talking about women that they had, were recently with. They recently, outside of marriage, pursued other women in different cities and that sort of thing. My wife was friends with some of the, the wives of these guys, and we heard some of their conversation. Oh, I was with this girl one day, and oh, I was with that girl too. And you're like, oh my gosh, what is going on? And they're all talking about it, and, you're, and, you, and I'm sitting in my locker just listening. And then they kind of look at one guy and say, what about you, man? What? What have, you, what have you been doing? What, who have you been with lately? And he said, oh, man, I, I, I haven't been in with anybody. And what are you talking about? We were just in Toronto. I know, but, man, I've been dating this girl for about a year now, and I think I want to marry her, and I just don't think it's right. And they kind of laughed at him, made fun of him. Like, what are you, what's wrong with you? Why would you be faithful? I mean, no one's going to find out. You're in a foreign city. Who cares? This is common. And this kind of dispersed and... I walked up to the guy after, and I said, hey, man, something's different about you. What's going on in your life? Why aren't you like these other guys? And he said, well, honestly, man, I'm, I, if you want to know the truth, I love Jesus. I'm a Christian, and I, I just I follow what the Bible says, and I, I, I just don't believe I should be engaging in those things. I believe I, I should be faithful to her, but that's what God wants me to do, man. Wow. That's what I'm talking about different. Let me submit to you and say, if you look like everybody at your job, if you look like everybody in your circle, if you look like everybody in your, even in your family or your extended family, I might I submit to you and say, are you really walking by the Spirit? 
Are you really distinct? And I'm not talking about you're distinct because you wear Christian clothes and you go to Christian conferences and you only watch Christian TV and you got that box that filters all the stuff off the television and, and you, you, know, you do all those things. I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking about culturally distinct. I'm talking about theologically distinct. I'm talking about a way of life that is so different that everybody notices because something's different about him. His top five, you know, they're different. Man, I'm going to challenge you guys on that. I'm going to challenge you guys to not live a life that looks like everybody else around you just because you feel the pressure to be like everyone else. Jesus is a better God. God is a better God. He looks a certain way. Okay, what about our last one? Walking by the Spirit requires one actual choice at a time. I think that when... Some of us meet Jesus. Let's say we meet Christ in eighth grade out of some sort of youth camp, or maybe we, we came to Alpine and we met Christ here. And wherever we meet Jesus, some of us kind of think that once we're saved, we've got sets of sins, bad habits, what have you. And once I meet, once I actually engage in a relationship with Jesus, those will essentially kind of be rooted out of me forever, like some sort of spiritual appendectomy, like, like oh, there goes my alcoholism, floats off into the abyss. Or, oh, oh my gosh, oh my, I'm never angry on the road anymore. Doesn't have, you know that's not true, especially in Utah, okay, where the state bird is the yellow cone or the orange cone, right? There is just insane amounts of construction around here, but that's here neither here nor there. Um, it's important to know that if you, be, if you become a Christian for any length of time and you said, man, I'm changed, everything's moving in the right direction, here we go, here we go, here we go, all of a sudden, three, four, five days later, maybe a week later, you've slipped kind of back into some of those behaviors that you thought they were gone forever. You know what I'm talking about. And those behaviors haven't left. That's because God doesn't just make you well. He actually also calls you to move. Let's see what Paul says here in our next verse. Galatians 5.25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. I would have these discussions with a friend. I was a pastor in the Seattle area for a little bit right after football, and I would have these discussions with a friend, and I would tell him, man, I think God, God is the one who's coming down. He's leading us. He's guiding us. He's, he's met us where we are, and he said, man, listen, if it's all about God meeting me, then what the heck am I supposed to do? Am I just some giant puppet where God is controlling my actions all of the time? No. You are not a puppet. God's calling you to do something. What, what are we supposed to do with the Spirit? I think this verse answers it. Let us follow the Spirit's leading. So what's our job? To follow. What's the Spirit's job? To lead. We must let the Spirit lead us. We cannot be out in front of them. But more importantly for this point, guys, some of us have, are exactly the same person now that we were five years ago. True story? Some of us are the same person. Some of us are the same person 10 years ago. Some of us met Christ and have not changed since. And I'm not talking about church attendance, Bible study. I'm talking about pursuing the living God in a great, loving relationship and letting his life flow out of you so to the point where you're so distinct people don't even recognize you anymore. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. We have actual choices to make. We must act Jesus has done the heavy lifting, to be sure. He's laid the groundwork out in front of us, and he's done the heavy lifting. We can't save ourselves, but God saved us. We look out, we see that God's opening doors for us to, to do the things we are. Maybe he's moving us to a job. Maybe he's moving us to a different school. Maybe he's moving us to calling us to be a part of Alpine or to be a part of other church families, whatever it may be. God's doing those things. But he's calling you to do one thing, follow, follow. Let's be honest, Some of, so much of this is just this, philosophizing around, around the, uh, what the Bible actually means. So some of us will get in our, our small groups or with family and we'll sit here and we'll be read a verse. And we'll go, ah, what does follow really mean now? I don't really get it. I mean, what, should I actually go? And what, is, what, what am I actually supposed to do for God? Uh, it's kind of murky. I think maybe I'll just think about it for another few years. It's pretty simple. I'll close with this story in John chapter 5 and Mark 2. There was a paralyzed man laying in a bed. A paralyzed man who cannot walk. Jesus comes upon this man, looks at the man, and he says, Son, your sins are forgiven. 
Wow, pretty awesome story. Doesn't end there. Then the Pharisees, who for some reason are in this house, I don't know if they're like looking out the hut window or whatever they're doing, but they're, they're peering in going, oh, he can't forgive sin. That's blasphemy. He can't, he can't do that. And what does Jesus say? He says, turns to the Pharisees and says, what's easier for me to say? For to tell him that his sins are forgiven or tell him to get up and walk? This man's been paralyzed for a long time. And what does the man do? Well, while he's laying there, Jesus looks back at him and he says, pick up your mat and go home. And what does the Bible say next? My favorite word for this. Immediately, immediately, this man picked up his mat, rolled it up, and went. So many of us are still laying on the floor. Jesus has said, your sins are forgiven. You can walk by the Spirit now. You can change. You can grow. You don't have to be mastered by what you've done. You don't have to be mastered by what's been done to you. You can go. And some of us lay there. Ah. What's next, Lord? What does is, what is immediately really mean? What, do, what does follow really mean? Should, what does go mean? No, it's time to go. Some of us need to roll our mats up and go home. So what is walking by the Spirit? It's relationship-based. It calls you to be in an intimate relationship with Jesus and with the people around you. It's Spirit-empowered. It's not self-empowered. It's not self-actualization. It's not self-personal growth. It's Spirit-led, spirit-filled ministry. It's walking, walking by the Spirit also looks a certain way. Your aroma will be different. People will notice that you're different. If you look like everyone around you, if you are exactly the same, how will people come to know the good news of Jesus? And finally, walking by the Spirit requires one foot in front of the other, one decision at a time. Nothing will change through osmosis, guys. You've got to put one foot in front of the other. It is a grind and a hustle to grow and get better. And some of you struggle. Some of you, some of you have been mastered by something for, for years. And I tell you, Jesus says, do not give up. Pick up your mat and go. It's a hustle.